You guys asked for it, so despite the fact that I think a video filmed almost entirely in a closet is gonna be pretty hard to make engaging, I'm gonna take my best shot at it, and here it is. A full walkthrough of my custom-designed 3D printer enclosure, including the various 3D printed features and add-ons I've put in, and how you can create your own similar enclosure. Oh, and stick around to the end because I have some really surprising ones that you can even use without an enclosure to level up your 3D printing experience. Let's dive in. First things first, let's talk about this enclosure itself and then we'll get into all the little details and printable features. The enclosure itself is a custom-made cabinet created by a carpenter when we moved into the house. It features two layers of two centimeter thick plywood all around for strength, insulation, and sound deadening, as well as a glass door in the front with a matte black inner finishing and heat set matte white finishing on the outside. It's built to withstand as much weight as I can throw at it, and I even had the carpenter sit in there, so I could put a lot of weight in there if I wanted to. That's important, not because I plan on sleeping in there, but because some printers, like my Prusa MK3, need a paving stone to quiet them down and stop the whole thing from becoming a big vibrating speaker box. Now, wait, 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 before you click away because you think that this is too expensive or not practical or doesn't apply to your home setup, there are a few things I wanna share and a few reasons you should stick around anyways. First of all, just because this is a custom cabinet doesn't mean that you can't still build in a lot of these features into any old enclosure, including the popular lack enclosure. So feel free to use the chapters below to skip ahead if you already have an enclosure and just wanna know how to trick it out. Second of all, even having this done custom with a carpenter wasn't that expensive. In fact, I actually had to have the cabinet made twice because I took bad measurements the first time and my CR10 bed was moving more than I thought and slamming into the glass door. Side note, if any of you in Israel would like to buy a barely used cabinet just like this, but more narrow and without the door, hit me up. All in all, having this enclosure made professionally probably cost me around $700 to $800, and that's in Israel where this type of work is very expensive, and this is a particularly large cabinet because I have a large format printer in there. You could probably get it made for less where you live. Plus, if you consider that two Prusa enclosures would cost you that much before shipping and not offer all the features I'm gonna share with you in a minute, well, that's actually not so bad. Finally, if that still sounds pricey to you, not to worry. You can achieve the same thing with a lot of ready-made solutions. For example, an Ikea closet, a secondhand display case with sturdy wooden shelves like this one I found on Craigslist, I've even seen one YouTuber who has a bunch of different 3D print farms distributed at friends' apartments, and he actually runs all his printers in IKEA closets. So it can be done, it has been done, and you can adapt a lot of this to a budget-conscious approach. All right, the next and most important area that we need to focus on is ventilation and filtration. Now, this was particularly important to me because my wife and I both sit in this tiny office all day long, and I print a range of materials from PLA to PETG, but also ASA and ABS as well as TPU. And I don't want harmful VOCs or airborne particles getting into our lungs. For ventilation and filtration, I took a multi-stage approach. My first objective was to clean the air inside the enclosure. Because I have two printers running, I open the enclosure quite a bit to change filament, remove prints, and so on, which means that when I do open it, the air inside needs to already be filtered, whether it exits through an exhaust or through the front door. To prevent air from leaving the enclosure, I installed automotive door sealant strips all the way around. And I tweaked the hinge mechanisms so that the door itself is actually pressure closed against the body, meaning that the door can apply some pressure to the sealant strips and get a really good seal. This also helps a lot with noise. Inside the enclosure, I printed and installed this ingenious filter design featuring a 120 millimeter PC fan. The filter features a common-sized and easy-to-remove HEPA filter to remove particular matter, which you can easily replace on AliExpress. And then, in back of that, I installed two sheets of activated carbon, which helps remove odors and VOCs. The fan isn't incredibly powerful, but it seems to be doing the job because I've tested the air quality with an air quality meter inside the enclosure, both with and without the fan working, and I definitely do see a difference in air quality. 
Rather than install a switch for the fans, I got really lazy and just installed one of those temperature switches that I talked about in my hardware to keep on hand video. That switch will trigger the fan at 30 degrees Celsius, which the enclosure will get to if I'm printing for more than a few minutes. Basically, I'm using the heat as a function to determine whether there could be enough air pollution to need the fan. But truthfully, there's no reason why you wouldn't do this more advanced. For example, you could design a custom circuit board with an air quality sensor, different kinds of LEDs that light up to tell you what quality the air is, and then have it turning on different fans or all kinds of different gizmos and gadgets based on the results of your sensors. In fact, even if you don't have the tools and setup to make PCBs and things like that at home, Today's sponsor, PCBWay, can help you do exactly that. PCBWay is your one-stop shop for projects, whether you're building one or 1,000. They can help you out with industrial, 3D printing, sheet metal bending, CNC machining, or, of course, as their name suggests, they can develop PCBs for you. They also give you an insane offer where you can get 10 PCBs for $5, as well as an initial $5 coupon for everyone who signs up. So if you want to level up your next project, adding in PCBs, interactivity, metal parts, or really anything, check out PCB Way using the link in the description below. Thanks for supporting this channel and thanks to PCB Way for making this video possible. Up next, I had to deal with ventilation or rather exhaust. Now you might be thinking that you want your enclosure to be as hot as possible, but in most cases, you really don't. First of all, you'll note that the electronics for my printers, including the PSUs, Raspberry Pis, and control boards are all still in the enclosure. And for that reason, I really don't like to see temperatures above 35 degrees on these little hygrometer temperature things that I also installed in there, because that would hurt the longevity of my printers. What's more, for printing things like PLA, your cooling will suffer if the ambient air temperature gets much higher than that. In fact, I sometimes will even open the door to rapidly drop the temperature when I'm printing PLA. Plus, I'm not printing nylon or peak or anything that needs really high temperatures, and I find that I can print ASA and ABS just fine at 35 degrees ambient temperature, as long as there are no drafts. For all these reasons, I printed and installed yet another filtration system, this one as an exhaust design. It uses the widely available HEPA filter from Arumba Robotic Vacuum paired with some squares of cut up activated carbon and then mated to a custom made tube that I designed in Onshape to create a 90 degree angle smoothly. I also designed and printed a custom, much more sturdy sliding bracket for the system than the one that was provided, which I'll link in the description below so that I can quickly and easily swap the filters and activated charcoal. Now I've been trying a bunch of different fans here, going back and forth between more powerful ones and quieter ones, and I think I've decided that I'm going to switch back to the Noctua 60 millimeter fan because the location of this fan and its proximity to the wall, even with this airflow muffler design that I printed out, means that it can get really loud if it's not an ultra quiet fan. This entire housing is connected to the same circuit as my other fan, by the way, with a 35 degree Celsius fan installed in front of it. So it only activates at higher temperatures, like if I'm printing with both printers at once. That way I can cut down on noise and only filter the air coming out if I actually need to exhaust that air. Additionally, I found that this small 60 millimeter hole was simply not enough to keep temperatures below 35C, especially because I'm technically creating a vacuum in there without any kind of air inlet. So I recently drilled a big, ugly hole in the back bottom of the enclosure behind my filament dryer to allow airflow in. I also have a bunch of holes throughout the middle shelf to allow heat to rise. Now this should create a current from bottom to top, and while it does work, and I definitely can feel the air flowing into the chamber when I put my hand under there, it's still not enough to keep temperatures down if I'm printing, for example, ASA on both printers, like during my Voron build. So I'm considering a few different solutions here, and I want your guys' opinion. First, I might just put the noisier fan in the middle shelf to help the heat rise and exit the chamber, or I might just remove the muffler up top when I switch back to a Noctua fan up there. I also bought another 60 millimeter Noctua fan when they were on sale, and I'm thinking to add that in the hole in the bottom to basically force the air in as I'm forcing it out. Now, let me know in the comments below which one of those different solutions you think would work best, 
without creating a draft over either of the printers and thereby warping my ASA and ABS printers. I really appreciate your inputs and I'm sure some of you are better at flow dynamics than I am. After ventilation and filtration, the next most important thing is going to be spool management. I needed a solid way to store more than one or two spools where they would spin freely and avoid failed prints, but also be easy and quick to remove and replace. I also needed a way to clear the way so I can take the entire printer out in case I need to do some regular maintenance work. Fortunately, I found the filler design platform for spool holders, which has been remixed and adapted to literally hundreds of different applications from printers to enclosures and so on. This design uses the common 608 bearings that I keep on hand at all times, and they spin smooth as a baby's bottom. Now, what I love about this design is that you can slide off the entire spool holder if you need to, say, clear space or just make it easier to load the filament. However, I also remixed a remix of the design and made my own much shorter version because I wanted to have room for the CR10 to move about. Now, I have a medium length spool holder on the far side, which is the shortened version of the original, where it would be tougher to reach given the height of my enclosure. And I have one of my ultra short ones near me to save space on the other side. You can actually download my files in the description below. With the detachable spool holders in place, I also needed a way to route filament smoothly so that it wouldn't unwind off the spool, get caught, or pull the entire roll off the spool holder. For this, I simply downloaded these giant Bowden tube holders and then drilled or melted out the inside rather than actually putting Bowden tubes in there. The most important thing to note here about this piece is that I only screwed one side of them into the cabinet so that they can rotate freely without getting stuck. I put these on the bottom cabinet only because for my CR10, I just route the filament through the support bars and that does basically the same thing. A 3D printer generates a ton of waste from purge lines to skirts and brims and so on. Now this means that I generally have to get in there with a vacuum once a month at least and clean out all that various mess. But in between those cleanings, I use this genius sliding bin that I printed out and attached to the bottom of the enclosure. It features a rim that holds the bin in Plus, I designed a flexible string wrangler that snaps on the front and printed it from TPU to make it easier to shove long strands of filament in there without them escaping. Let's not forget tools, tools, tools. You're going to need a lot of tools in your enclosures and you want to have them handy. Now, I covered the entire list of tools in two separate videos that I published recently. So if you haven't seen both of those, open this link in a new tab. But as far as organizing these tools, I remixed this design for my own needs, one for each side of the enclosure, so I have the exact tools I need where I need them. You can find dozens of different tool holders out there, but personally, I really like my two designs because of the angle and because they fit everything I need, so feel free to download them and give a like if you do. Also, for organizing temporary stuff that I don't always need handy, such as a cigar lighter or a glue stick if I'm printing ABS, extra nozzles, things like that, I printed out a Gridfinity base and some bins that I can use to store all that stuff. I move them out of the way and into my drawers when they're not needed, but I can dock them in the cabinet when they are. By the way, if you haven't seen my Gridfinity tips video, you can check that one out right here. Now, let's talk lighting. Lighting is really important, both for monitoring your prints and for creating time lapses. And so it's important to have strong, reliable lighting that doesn't flicker. I went through a lot of iterations here from installing LED strips all around the enclosure to designing my own custom housings with RGB light strips inside to buying ready-made cabinet lights that connect to my smart home. None of it was bright enough to really light my enclosure well enough. Now, I guess that's the downside of having a very large enclosure with a very dark interior. Finally, I got frustrated with dim RGB light sources and I decided to go nuclear. I tore apart two old outdoor floodlights, which I had in the shed, which are designed to light a large backyard, and I took out the LED panels from each of them to save space. I then designed custom brackets for the front and back, a different angle for both the top and bottom because the different heights of different sections require it, and then I printed those in temperature-resistant ASA filament. They have been holding up great, and even though I leave the lights on for literally days at a time, they show no signs of warping or material creep. Now, you probably don't have some old floodlights kicking around in your shed, 
But if I can give you one piece of advice here, it's that while I miss having the cool RGB dancing color lights, LED strips are probably not gonna be strong enough if you wanna take really good time lapses and allow for good failure detection with an AI print monitoring solution like Obico or Octo Everywhere. If I had to do it all over again, starting from scratch, I probably would just order some big, bright, bare LED panels on AliExpress and custom design a minimalist housing like the one I have from day one. Instead of trying to make LED strips or puck lights work, I just should have started with something really bright. Now that we have all the lights and fans wired up, we're going to have to get rid of all those ugly cables. Now here, admittedly, I stopped halfway and I still need to get around to finishing. But as I mentioned before in my 50 things you didn't know you could print video, I print all kinds of cable channels for all kinds of uses, and here is no different. I actually designed and 3D printed cable channels that specifically go into corners, and I printed them in black filament to match the cabinet. Again, I still need to find the time and energy to print and glue in more of them once I finish upgrading those fans I mentioned before, but here you can see an example of how much these clean up the cables in my enclosure. One of the cool things about having this enclosure is that I'm much less worried about fires, fumes, and so on because I know that whatever happens, it's mostly contained and without oxygen to start a real fire. Though I probably should put in some kind of fire extinguisher solution in there, so let me know in the comments if you have any recommendations. In any case, this added a whole new comfort level and it also reduced the noise so it means that I can run my printers pretty much 24 seven, whether I'm asleep or even if I'm not home. But in order to make that really feasible, I needed a solution for monitoring them remotely. First and foremost, I installed a Raspberry Pi 3B plus a touchscreen running OctoPrint and OctoDash on each of my printers. I actually printed housings for these and mounted them right onto the printers themselves. I even wired the Raspberry Pis directly to the printers using a buck converter Though recently one of those failed and I'm waiting on a replacement, so pardon the white power cable running from outside the enclosure. Then I picked up some secondhand Logitech C920 webcams for each of them. At first, I mounted these cameras using 3D printed arms and all kinds of stuff like that, but they just weren't stable enough. So I used these cheapy magic arms that I have for photography and videography mounted either to the printer itself or a custom sliding mount designed for the cabinet. They're much more stable that way, which is really important for good time lapses, and they don't break after adjusting them three times, like the 3D printed camera solutions I had before. All of this is hooked up to a premium subscription with Obico, thank you Obico, which offers remote access to your 3D printers, as well as AI print failure detection, telegram notifications, a mobile app, and so on. This video isn't sponsored by Obico, but I do and have worked with them in the past and I do recommend their product. Okay, we've gotten to the end and I promised you some surprising and exciting ones that you could use with or without an enclosure, so let's get into it. First, the boring part. I needed a ton of outlets or at least a ton of space on a power strip mounted in a place that won't move or wiggle, and so I ordered this server rack power strip with eight outlets and mounted it right on the back wall. Now, the reason I needed so many outlets wasn't because of the printers themselves. I mean, each one needs one plug because the Raspberry Pi is hardwired directly to it, or the fans, which all need one plug, or even the lights, which are also one plug, or even the filament dryer, which again, is also one plug. I needed such a big power strip because I have various bulky smart plugs wired up to each one of the printers, as well as a remote control one, which works on just a basic RF remote rigged up to the lights. Now these smart plugs are a game changer because they not only allow me to turn the printers on and off remotely, adding one more layer of protection, but they also allow me to say schedule shutoffs. So at the most basic level, if I know a print is going to take two hours, but I'm going to bed now, I can set the printer to turn off in two and a half hours to save electricity and wear and tear on my PSU and fans. But beyond that, these smart plugs also integrate with Home Assistant, my home automation platform of choice, and when I get around to it, I can finally use that to automatically shut off the printer if, for example, a print finishes and it's between the hours of 10 and 7 a.m. Then I won't have to manually schedule those shutoffs at all. Also, one perk of getting the slightly more expensive spark plugs, which are like a dollar more, is that they allow me to monitor power consumption in real time and give me a monthly report of how much power each printer used. This is really cool for estimating the actual cost of 3D prints if for example, you sell parts 
Realistically, I've realized that my electricity cost is pretty negligible with my printers, maybe because they operate in an enclosure and use a whole lot less energy to try and keep the bed warm than if they were outside in a cold office. By the way, I know you can buy a full power strip with Wi-Fi capability and the ability to control each outlet individually, but I haven't tried those out and I wanted to be sure. I also don't know if they have the ability to independently monitor power, Plus, I like that I can move my printers around and take the smart switch that's linked to them with them since I have it named in my smart home per printer. But you could definitely try those out. Oh, hey there, it's Editing Jonathan from the future. I just finished my Voron project. So number one, you should make sure that you're subscribed because I'm coming out with a video about that whole process next week. But in the process of finishing it and building it, I also realized that there are a lot of things about my cabinet that are rendered completely unnecessary or just downright incompatible by the Voron project. Those include the lights, which I no longer need because the Voron has them built in, the ventilation and filtration because the Voron has both of those built in, and spool management. So make sure that you are subscribed if you would like to see a future video where I handle all of those challenges before inevitably moving the Voron into the printer cabinet and let's see how I can figure those out. All right, this video came out much longer than I anticipated, especially given that it's all filmed basically inside a closet. But if you enjoyed it, make sure to give a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you'd like to see more content like this, please do consider becoming a patron using the link in the description below. It definitely helps me produce more content for all of you. Thanks for watching and happy 3D printing. Thank <laughs> you.